and welcome everybody. Welcome. Uh, definitely, September 11th reminds all of us to be praying for our nation. Actually, uh, let this past Sunday, uh, Pastor Jeremy put out a challenge for all of us as a church family to be praying, especially for our nation over these next few weeks as we head into uh, elections. A lot of times, you know, we you know, we talk about the elections and the candidate that we like and what we don't like about the one we don't like and all of that. But he really put a challenge out to us to really be praying for our nation. And there's power in prayer. I love what James wrote in his writings, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. And so there's something about a people that will pray and seek the face of God. And when we do that for our nation, it, uh, I believe God hears our prayers and He answers them. And um, I think it's a lot more productive than just getting caught up in all the rhetoric, just to really focus on seeking the Lord and seeking His face for our nation. But definitely 9-11 reminds us to, to take time to do that. But thank you for being here tonight. Those of you that are brand new, we've, we've welcomed you. Pastor Renato had us welcome everybody that might be here for the first time and people joining us online for the first time. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Glad you could be here with us. My name is Jim. I have the, the privilege of serving here at the Highlands as the care pastor. And uh, so it's just a real honor to be able to share with you tonight. We, we actually are continuing a series that we began last Wednesday, we're calling 70 times 7, dealing with the topic of forgiveness. And the concept of 70 times 7 comes actually from a conversation that Peter had with Jesus during his earthly ministry. If you have a Bible and you'd like to follow along or Bible app, or you can, if you've got our Bible app for the Highlands, you can go to the notes page there as well. It'll be on the screen, but this conversation took place in the book of Matthew chapter 18, where the Lord, uh, Peter says to the Lord, how many times may my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times, Jesus said to him, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Now, Jesus wasn't telling Peter to forgive 490 times, but the statement actually means times without number or as many times as it takes. And we explored the fact that Jesus would not be asking Peter to do something that he himself was not willing to do. And so it's not like Jesus is saying to, to Peter and the rest of us, hey, you know, as many times as it takes, but he's obligating himself as well to forgive as many times as it takes. And I don't know about you, but for me, that's good news. That's good news. That Jesus forgives us as many times as it takes. So last week we talked about receiving Christ's forgiveness. Tonight we're going to talk about forgiving ourselves. But first, a humorous story about forgiveness. So there's this particular couple, we won't name, we won't name names, that was, found themselves arguing quite often. But the wife was always calm, forgiving toward her husband. And one day her husband commented on her restraint saying, you know, when I get mad, he said, you never seem to fight back. You never seem to get ruffled or upset about that. Or, or you know, you don't let uh, anger control you. And he said, what, how do you do that? To which she replied, well, I work it off by cleaning the toilet. And he, he kind of scratches his head by, well, that, that's really strange. I don't understand. How does that help? To which she replied, I use your toothbrush. 
I suppose that's one way to deal with forgiveness. The moral of the story is men hide your toothbrush. But when believers are asked the question, what's the most difficult thing that you've ever had to face as it relates to forgiveness? And the overwhelming response is, my biggest forgiveness issue has to do with myself. I can't seem to forgive myself for what I've done, for the pain that I've caused, or the failures I've experienced. Maybe a failed marriage, or maybe, and this one comes up a lot, maybe it's a parenting issue. We feel like, you know, we just failed in that area, or how I've treated others, or how I reacted in a difficult situation, or maybe I'm dealing with uh, forgiving myself about a habit that I've had, or an addiction. I've worked with our recovery ministry here at the Highlands for over 15 years, and without a doubt, I've discovered that the biggest issue in overcoming addiction is forgiveness. Accepting Christ's forgiveness, forgiving ourselves, and then also forgiving other people who have wronged us. Have you ever struggled to forgive yourself? Often the most difficult person to forgive is ourselves. Yet it's essential in growing in our relationship with Jesus and learning how to forgive others. We get a glimpse of this in something that Paul wrote to the believers in Ephesus. We read in Ephesians 4.32 where he says, Be kind to each other, tender-hearted, Forgiving one another just as God has forgiven you. Did you notice the just as or in the same way? So in the same way that God has forgiven us, we are to forgive others. And so God has forgiven us, we, we, but yet there are times when we can't forgive ourselves. We just can't seem to move past that the issue, the, the failure, the, and it's, I think, especially hard for people who have a, a, a perfectionist kind of a, a, a bent to them that, you know, it, it's hard when you have these perfectionist tendencies to, to fail, to, to feel like you've let somebody down or you've dropped the ball. But yet, how can we ever be expected to fulfill the mandate to forgive others if we can't forgive ourselves? And so, this issue of forgiving ourselves actually becomes a glass ceiling that we bump up against as it relates to forgiving others because we're, we're struggling with forgiving ourselves. And so I want to quickly share some reasons why you need to forgive yourself. And the first is this, it's what God wants you to do. It's what He wants you to do. I love this this verse in Isaiah 1, 18, where the Scripture says, Come now, let us settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. And in that passage, God is reminding us that He is so quick to forgive. He is so quick to move past. When we come to Him in repentance, He is so quick to forgive us. But yet we get caught up in not being able to forgive ourselves, even though He says according to His Word, that He has forgiven us. If God has forgiven you, why can't you forgive yourself? The second reason that we should forgive ourselves is because it's what the devil doesn't want us to do. He doesn't want you to forgive yourself. In Revelation 12.10, Satan is referred to as the accuser of the brethren. In John, the Scripture says, 
speaking of the devil, speaking of Satan, when he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And, and that's one of the reasons why we need to forgive ourselves, because the enemy doesn't want you to forgive yourself. He doesn't want you to be able to move past that failure. He doesn't want you to be able to move past that sin. He doesn't want you to be able to move past that time when you dropped the ball, when you, when you failed. He doesn't want you to be able to move past, but that's all the more reason to be able to move past it, isn't it? Because God wants you to, the enemy doesn't want you to, and thirdly, forgiving yourself will give you peace It'll set you free from your past, and it'll help you to become a better person. Man, that's a truckload of stuff right there, isn't it? Forgiving yourself is going to give you peace. There's this, this, uh, this phrase in Scripture, it's called the shalom, which is the peace of God. And when we think of peace, we think of the absence of conflict. But God's sense of peace goes beyond just the absence of conflict. It speaks of a wholeness that God wants to bring into our lives, this shalom, this peace of God. And in one place, the Scripture talks about the peace of God. In this way, it says that the peace of God passes all understanding. In other words, when issues and situations are going on all around us, we can still yet find ourselves living in the peace of God. Why? Because the peace of God, it it surpasses circumstances and issues and situations. That shalom, peace of God. And when we forgive ourselves, we find this sense of peace, this sense of freedom from the past. Not being able to forgive ourselves is like like having an iron chain wrapped around our ankle and dragging this ball and chain with us throughout life. Not being able to find the freedom and move past the mistakes of our past. But I'm I'm here to tell you tonight that God has a better future for you. He has a better future than being able to than than having to, to drag your mistakes along through life with you. Jesus said in John 8 32, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And, and, and through the a course of preparing this message, I just had deep in my spirit that God wants to set someone free from the mistakes of the past. He wants to help you move on into a better future for yourself by letting go of the past, by allowing Him to set you free. And the truth says this, we read in 1 Corinthians 1.30, Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy and freed us, freed us from sin. And then the fourth reason that we should forgive ourselves is that forgiving ourselves will improve our physical, emotional, and spiritual health. And I'm a firm believer that the healthier we can get emotionally and spiritually, the healthier the relationships that we have in our lives will be. You can't put brokenness and brokenness together in relationship and expect this healthy, flourishing relationship. But when we start to find healing for our past mistakes and sin in our life, we start to find spiritual and emotional healing, then our relationships can be healthier as a result of that. It's a powerful concept. And I, lo- I love 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. 
Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So now let's take a look in the Bible at a person who probably had more reason than anyone else who ever lived to struggle with the issue of trying to forgive himself. His name, coincidentally, is Peter. This is the very man that Jesus had this conversation with about how many times should we forgive. We begin our story with Jesus and his disciples in the upper room on the night prior to his betrayal and crucifixion. Jesus had washed their feet, they enjoyed a meal together, and now they were on their way to pray in the garden. And we pick up this story in Matthew 26, and we'll, we'll read several progressing verses out of Matthew 26. So as they walk along in verse 31, Jesus says, this very night, all of you will run away and leave me. So we're, we're building up to the, uh, his trial, his arrest, his trial, crucifixion, burial. We're building up to that, and he's telling them on their way to the garden to pray that every one of them is going to run away and leave him. We pick up a couple verses later in verse 33. Peter spoke up and said to Jesus, I will never leave you, even though all the rest do. Jesus said to Peter, I tell you that before the rooster crows tonight, you will say three times that you do not know me. And Peter answered, I will never say that, even if I have to die with you. And then 11 verses later, when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus in the garden, just as he had predicted, all the disciples, including Peter, left him and ran away. This is 10, 11 verses later. And then we read a couple of verses beyond that. As Jesus was taken to the high priest, it says, Peter followed from a distance. So as Jesus stood before the high priest and they began to spit in his face, slap him, beat him with their fists, we pick up the story again in 11 verses later, verse 69, and, and the story begins to unfold even more. Peter was sitting in the courtyard. A girl came over and said to him, you were with Jesus, for both of you are from Galilee. But Peter denied it loudly. I don't even know what you're talking about, he angrily declared. Later, out by the gate, another girl noticed him and said to those standing around, this man was with Jesus from Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it, this time with an oath, saying, I don't even know the man. But after a while, the men who had been standing there came over to him and said, we know you are one of his disciples, for we can tell by your Galilean accent. Peter began to curse and swear, I don't even know the man, he said. And immediately... The cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went away crying bitterly. He had betrayed the Lord. When things got really difficult and really hard, and I would say when Jesus needed him most. He denied that he, he ever knew the Lord. And do you think that was the last time that Peter ever heard a rooster crow? See, more than likely, every time Peter heard a rooster crow, he was reminded of his failures. Think about it. When do roosters normally crow? In the morning, sun comes up, er, er, er. 
first thing every morning, Peter is slapped in the face with a reminder of his failure. He'd go to sleep. Maybe he worked through the issues through the day, bright and early. Here comes that rooster, reminding him of his failure. How he had denied three times that he even knew the Lord. How he had let Jesus down when he needed him the most. And then three days after Jesus is crucified, Mark records something interesting in his writing. Some women had gone to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. As they approached the tomb, they found that the stone was already rolled away. And upon going into the tomb, they encountered an angel of the Lord who said, He has risen. He is not here. And we celebrate that day with Easter. And then the angel says something in addition to that that's somewhat peculiar. He says, go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. Now, it says, go tell the disciples. Now, wasn't Peter a disciple? Yes. That, could, that would have covered it, right? But he didn't. I think the Lord prompted him to make sure for Peter's sake that not only did he say, go tell the disciples, but go tell the disciples and Peter. He wanted him to get the message. After that, Jesus appeared several times to his followers. And on the third time, Peter had gone back to doing the only thing he knew how to do. And that was to fish. He was a fisherman by trade. And when Jesus called him to follow him, he forsook his fishing, the fishing industry. He followed Jesus three and a half years. And then Jesus was crucified, so Peter goes back to the only thing he knows, and that's fishing. He'd fished all night in this particular occasion and caught nothing. And as he and the others were heading back to shore after a long night of fishing, Jesus, resurrected Jesus, was waiting on the shore and had breakfast prepared for them. And as he sat and talked with them, he asked Peter, do you love me more than these? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then he asks a second time, slightly different phraseology, but he asks a second time, do you love me? Again, Peter replies, yes, you know that I love you. And a third time, Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? And Peter replies, you know all things. You know that I love you. How many times did Peter deny that he even knew the Lord? Three times. How many times did Jesus give Peter the opportunity to declare his love for him? Three times. That's redemption, folks. That's, that's Jesus stepping in. That's Jesus fulfilling that truth as many times as it takes. If Peter would have denied him four times, I believe he would have asked four times, do you love me? If he would have denied him six times, I believe Jesus would have given him six opportunities to declare his love. Because what Jesus said with that phrase 70 times 7 was as many times as it takes. As many times as it takes. So Jesus gives this, this special opportunity to affirm his love and his commitment to him. And I believe to allow Peter to work through some of the issues of guilt that he had been struggling with, that he was reminded of every time 
a rooster crowed. And then later, on this very special day, the day of Pentecost, Holy Spirit is poured out upon the church. They're, they're in Jerusalem and, and the Spirit of God is poured out and people in the city are attracted to what's going on and they, they start to ask questions. Who do you think was the first one to preach a message in the New Testament church? It was Peter. He was the very first one to preach a message and he, and he preached Christ and Him crucified. And after He got finished preaching, the people, they were just, their hearts were so affected that they cried out and they said, what should we do? And here's Peter's response. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. The very first words that came out of his mouth in response to that was repent. Repent. What is repentance? Repentance is asking God to forgive you. Who better to communicate that message than Peter? Because he had been forgiven, and now he's able to declare to this crowd of 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost, repent, because Jesus will forgive you. And then later on, after some healings had taken place in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, again, people were, had gathered around and Peter preached to them the gospel of Jesus saying, repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Who better? Who better to preach that message? than Peter who discovered firsthand for himself that God had forgiven him of this colossal mistake that he had made in forsaking Jesus at that critical hour. So how do we forgive ourselves and walk in the freedom that Christ has made possible for us? It begins by recognizing where guilt comes from. And I, I just want to take a couple more minutes here to tell you that there are two types of guilt that most of us find ourselves dealing with. The first is pseudo-guilt, and the second is true guilt. Now, let's look at pseudo-guilt first. Pseudo-guilt is false guilt that is unfounded and has nothing to do with sin. Pseudo-guilt, though it's false, is also very real to the person that's dealing with it. We feel keenly guilty, but there is no good reason for this sense of guilt. Let me give you an example from my, my own life. Some of you know my testimony. I grew up in a home with alcoholic parents. Alcoholism, of course, as it often does, led my parents to divorce when I was seven. And somewhere in the midst of the dysfunction, my little seven-year-old mind must have decided that there was something wrong with me, that in some way I must have been responsible. And so I lived with this sense of buried guilt in my life for years, for years. This, this little seven-year-old kid that had nothing to do with my parents' divorce, with the breakup of our family, didn't have, I didn't have anything to do with it. But yet, I had this pseudo-guilt going on inside of me. What is wrong with me? There must be something wrong with me and dealt with self-image problems for many, many years. It was, it was pseudo-guilt. Another example of pseudo-guilt comes when you maybe had sin, maybe you had done something that you've, you've known grieved the heart of God, but you confessed that sin, but you don't feel forgiven. Once we've acknowledged our sin and taken it to the Lord, we should accept our forgiveness and leave the rest in God's hands. Another word for pseudo-guilt is condemnation. 
condemnation. The Bible says this about condemnation in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. See, once you've identified that you're dealing with pseudo-guilt, just don't go there. Just don't go there. Just don't allow the enemy to keep rehearsing that because you've already taken care of it by confessing it to the Lord and allowing Him to forgive you. Don't allow yourself to be controlled by your emotions. Don't allow the enemy to weigh you down with false guilt because he'll try to do it. The second type of guilt is true guilt, otherwise known as conviction in Scripture. As a result of our sin against God, we have a very clear directive on how to deal with real guilt. This is a verse worth committing to memory, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that a powerful verse? That's precisely how we deal with real guilt. We confess our sins and He is faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. He took our place. He takes care of true guilt by doing two basic things. First, He washes it away as though it never existed. He washes it away as though it never existed. And secondly, His sacrifice on the cross perfectly satisfies God's eternal justice. See, because God is a just God. And sin has to be dealt with. So here's what Jesus did. He took our sin upon Himself and became the perfect sacrifice for our sin. I messed up. I failed. I disappointed God. Jesus took all of that on himself for my sake and for your sake. Did you know that although the word forgiven or forgive in some form appears 123 times in the Bible, and yet there is no direct reference to forgiving yourself? So, Pastor Jim, why are you talking about this tonight? Because forgiving yourself actually means to come into agreement with the forgiveness that God has already offered you. And so when I forgive myself, I'm just coming into agreement with what God has already done if I've confessed it to Him. And so that's that's what forgiving ourselves is. It's just coming into agreement with God. And so I want to give you an invitation here tonight to come into agreement with God's forgiveness in your life. All across this room, those that are listening online and those who will access this message later potentially, Come into agreement with God's forgiveness in your life. Whether you're experiencing true guilt or false guilt, Jesus Christ wants you to experience His forgiveness. If you're a believer here tonight and you've been struggling to forgive yourself, I want to encourage you to turn it over to the Lord. It may not be forgiveness that you need. You may need faith to receive what Christ has already done for you. It might just be faith to say, okay, God, there is this, this element of faith that comes into play as it relates to forgiving ourselves. For others of you, in just a moment, we're going to pray a prayer together asking
for God's forgiveness and inviting Him into our hearts as our Lord and Savior. If you have never had the opportunity to do this, I want to invite you to join us in this prayer tonight. With every eye closed, no one looking around, if you would like to join us in this prayer tonight, just this sacred, solemn moment, just coming open and honest before the Lord. God, you know my heart tonight. You know the issues that I am dealing with, whether they're issues of pseudo-guilt. The enemy has just been plaguing me with condemnation. I've gone to the Lord. I've confessed my sin, but it just seems like I can't move past that. Lord, would you help me tonight to be able to move past that, to come into agreement with your forgiveness toward me. Or maybe here tonight, there's been a habit or an addiction or a brokenness, a pattern in my life that I've been dealing with. I know that this is not pleasing to the Lord. I know it's holding me back in my relationship with God. Tonight, I want to take care of that just by bringing it to the cross, recognizing that Jesus forgives as many times as it takes. And so once again, Lord, here I am, my heart is open before you, just saying, would you forgive me tonight? Would you forgive me? And if you've never prayed a prayer like that, just asking God to forgive you, I tell you, it's, it's a life changer. It'll make such a huge impact in your life. Not only does He forgive you, but he, he fills us with His Spirit. And so if you're here tonight, we're going to pray that kind of prayer in just a moment. And if, if you've never prayed that kind of prayer and you want to pray it with us, nobody's looking around. This is just between you and the Lord. But you want to pray that prayer with us. I'm going to lead us in that just simple prayer. And you would be open and honest enough with nobody looking just to raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I want to pray that prayer asking God to forgive me and to come into my life. And you just slip your hand right up and right back down. Nobody is looking around just between you and the Lord. All right. I see those hands right back there. God bless you and you, sir, and you, and you, and you, and you. Anybody else want to join these? And you, I see you. God bless you. More importantly, he sees. Anybody else just want to jump in and join these that are raising their hands? Awesome, awesome. I see you. What a great decision. All right. All right, I see you way back there. Man, the Holy Spirit is just speaking to our hearts tonight. Thank you for taking that bold step to raise your hand. And I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. You don't have to pray it out loud. You're not praying it to the people around you. You're, you're praying it to him and he'll hear your heart tonight. Just say something along this line. Just say, God, thank you for loving me first and foremost. That you love me so much that you would send your son Jesus to this earth to live a perfect sinless life but that he would take my sins, he would take my place, my punishment. Thank you, God, for that. That he would be crucified on a cross, put in a tomb, but he would rise again on the third day. And he would declare such things as, I will forgive you as many times as it takes. God, thank you for loving me that much. And I invite your Holy Spirit to fill my heart and my life so that I can continue walking with you from this day forward. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching this message uh, from the Highlands. Our goal here at the Highlands is to become people of the Word. We love the Word of God, and the message you just heard was filled with scriptures that we pray would be an encouragement to you. Make sure that you share if you were encouraged by this message with others to help us get God's Word out. Uh, if you have not yet subscribed to our channel, I want to encourage you. We have messages and content every week that would encourage you and help you grow in your faith. And then make sure you uh, just like this video. And we want to continue to get the gospel out to as many people as we know how to, as we're able to. This is great technology. Thank you for joining us on YouTube. We pray that you're encouraged. Pray that you have a great week and that you would live out what you just heard in your daily life.